This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Studios of WKTV. Let's go inside for Silent Voices. Hello and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices. Today we're going to go back to Carroll, Michigan as Elizabeth Hurd will be telling her grandson's story. The story of little Sean who is an angel in heaven right now. He never made it to his third birthday because he died at the hands of his mother. Little Sean, who was only two and a half, endured many things like having his big toenails ripped out of his feet and nail polish put in his eyes as punishment for unknown reasons. Here is Sean's grandmother, Elizabeth Hurd, telling his story. Thank all of you for being here and coming out in such a lousy day with weather, eh? But um, I'm glad you're here so you could hear our family's tragic story, Sean's tragic life story. Sir Winston Churchill said, Courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. Courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. So I thank all of you for coming to listen. This is Sean Michael Sowards. My name is Elizabeth Hurd, and I'm Sean's paternal grandmother. Sean was senselessly tortured his entire life and murdered at just two years, eight months, and 19 days old. His little boys, ignored while he was alive, is just one of thousands of children who were never heard and now forever silenced. I have found that silence deafening. And although I'm a character characteristically quiet person who is not at all comfortable being up in front of people let alone speaking, I promise this precious little light in my life that his voice would be heard through me. And I am now Sean's voice. I hope you'll forgive me for reading from my papers, but I do have a lot of things I want to say and I don't want to forget them. I don't want to throw my husband off track of the pictures. <laughs> Since becoming an advocate for the rights of children in my grandson's name, I am frequently asked to tell Sean's story. And though I sadly have limited knowledge of his short and pain-filled life, I will tell you what I knew, the horrific truth I became aware of, and what I know now. I was there the night of September 23rd, 2004, when we were blessed to welcome Sean, as he was born at Crittenden Hospital in Rochester, Michigan. Just as I had been there for my granddaughter's birth, just a year earlier. In 2003, both of the children's births were an absolute blessing, as all children are. You can keep up with me, honey. <laughs> yeah. And my heart overflowed with joy at their arrival. <clears throat> However, my joy of becoming a grandmother and my dreams of being in the lives of these two little, beautiful little souls were dashed just months after Sean's birth. As it became apparent that not everyone in Sean's family regarded him as the truly miraculous blessing he was. In June of 2007, <clears throat> our grief-stricken family, let me just pause for a second because I don't think you're up with me, honey. One more. Right there. In June of 2007, our grief-stricken family said goodbye and laid to rest this beautiful little soul we loved so dearly. Despite our warnings and concerns for his safety, to the agencies in place to protect children, Crystal Conklin, Sean's mother, or as I refer to her, Sean's monster, six 
successfully carried out her self-proclaimed hatred toward boys and tortured and murdered my innocent grandson. All voices speaking on his behalf, reporting suspicions and witnessed abuse were ignored. In January of 2005, I called police to check on my grandchildren when it came to my attention that my four-month-old grandson was being spanked by his mother for crying. The children were found to be fine, the police told me, but still very concerned for their safety, I called Child Protective Services in the city where they lived. I was told by the very pert woman on the phone that parents have a right to discipline their children and that it was none of my business. That's even a four-month-old infant. She also told me that unless my grandchild was either severely injured or dead, they would not step in. I was accused of trying to take the children away from their parents and was told, you're not going to get them, you know. I was scared to death for the children and I felt I had no choice to make these calls, but to make these calls, and once I was ignored, I had nowhere else to turn. Angry with me for making these calls, my son forbade us to have contact with him or the children. The flat where they lived at the time in Mount Clemens was a temporary arrangement, and so my husband and I spent the next year and a half not knowing how the children were or even where they were. They moved from motel to motel, dependent on the generosity of strangers and her family, wearing out their welcome and being evicted from all continuously. This time of not knowing was sheer agony. I prayed a lot of prayers. I cried a lot of tears through this time. Until finally, in the summer of 2006, and through a stream of events that could only be defined as divine intervention, my son contacted me. And I got to see the children again just before Sean's second birthday. He had scratches on his face that were said to be from my granddaughter a year older and a recurring eye infection that I was told was being treated by a pediatrician. I was concerned and in a very difficult spot, since I did not want to say or do anything that would prevent me from seeing the children, thus not allowing me to keep an eye out to make sure they were okay. It wasn't until after Sean's murder, and then and through our first person-to-person -person encounter with the Department of Human Services at what they call a team meeting, that we discovered our worries had been absolutely warranted. Then, and through hundreds, hundreds of pages of police, detective, and doctor reports, as well as testimony throughout the trial, we found out just what hell our precious baby boy had endured his entire life, despite our initial attempt at intervention and warning. John's mother was a very sick woman, and the ward of the state herself at the time she was a toddler. The entire family, we were told, was well known to the Department of Human Services through years of state intervention due to violence and abuse. We learned that many, many calls had been made to CPS and DHS after mine and over Sean's short life from numerous unrelated people, including her own family members, who told of what they saw her do to our beautiful grandson. She had huge issues with men from abuse she suffered in childhood and hated Sean because he was a boy. Over the time he missed in Sean's life, among the many complaints made to the Department of Human Services, we discovered reports made to them said, Ms. Conklin wakes Sean up from his naps and beats him, that she doesn't like Sean. She says mean things to Sean, speaking to him with absolute hatred, that she doesn't want him, that the only reason she'd kept Sean was because the father, my son, wanted him. Crystal's very own sister reported, that she'd always felt that Crystal didn't love Sean. Sean had always been restricted in his movement by a car seat, a high chair, or by being, by being very tightly wrapped by blankets, in other words, tied up. She said there was always so much anger toward him and that Crystal never allowed, allowed him to play and be a kid. These comments and much more came from this murderer's very own family. Witnesses to the abuse and hatred toward our beloved Sean, but they too were ignored. The Department of Human Services had this critical information that we, even with our suspicions, did not know. They had this knowledge of Sean's mother and her entire family being in the system for years. This certainly, certainly should have been considered to be huge red flags for possible threats of abuse and neglect to be passed on to her children. 
especially once reports and complaints from so many people of suspected and even eyewitness abuse accounts of abuse were brought to their attention. Still, no action was taken by this agency to protect Sean. It seems apparent to me that there are some serious flaws in the evaluation process of this department to determine what warrants intervention to protect a child. To date, no one from this agency has been held accountable for their inaction in the case of Sean's death or any other failure for which they are surely responsible. If you still question or want to give this agency the benefit of a doubt as to whether they played a role in the murder of my grandson, let me tell you just how severe his torture was. The night Sean entered the hospital, his poor little body was littered with bruises, head to toe, too numerous to count. He had bite marks, cigarette burns, black and blue knuckles, a broken index finger, and both of his big toenails were missing, ripped off. His eyes were chemically burned to the point of blindness, as the doctors believed and reported, most likely from the repetitive introduction of nail polish remover. He suffered massive and traumatic brain injuries and bleeding in the brain. We were also informed that while surgery was performed that night, two previous brain injuries were discovered. As the pediatric child abuse expert who testified at the trial described, Sean was abused ultimately in a singular event that caused his death, and a repetitive course throughout his existence. He suffered multiple abusive traumatic events over a period of, at the very least, several days, and possibly quite a bit longer. That includes his bruises and his injuries to his toenails. His feet, hands, and toenails give the appearance of a repetitive infliction of pain for purposes of discipline in a torture-type scenario. They were absolutely devastated. To learn all our beautiful grandson had been I can't even begin to tell you how many shattered pieces of my heart will ever recover from this knowledge. As is quoted on Sean's memorial site, I can only imagine what life would be like, would be like when your nightmares are better than your reality. The horror of that night and the sight of my beautiful grandson lying lifeless and beaten in a big hospital bed will be with me until the day I die. His mother hated him. She despised his very existence. And she viciously murdered him. Sean's big sister, I named Anna, <coughs> and just one year older, <coughs> was witness to the abuse he suffered, and even made to participate in the cruelty toward him. And on that fateful day, she witnessed her brother's murder. Feeling his pain, empathy rarely displayed by a three and a half year old, and completely laughing on the part of their mother, she cried out in his defense, yelling at her mother, don't do it, Mom. Don't. Her cries, too, were <laughs> ignored. And Sean was viciously beat to death by the very woman who should have only wanted to love and protect him and his sister. Sean loved and trusted his mother, and she betrayed him every day of his life. Arrested and in custody, she was questioned for seven hours and never once asked about the condition of her son. She showed absolutely no remorse, remorse or even any emotion at all until she was convicted. She cried then, but only for herself and for the fact that as the prosecuting attorney card referred to it, her dirty little secret was out. Sean's murder was found guilty of first degree murder and first degree child abuse she was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, plus an additional and consecutive 9 to 15 years. Although we will never see him again, 
he will never have the life he was entitled to. This was justice served for Sean, and we are grateful. But my beautiful, emotionally, and mentally abused granddaughter, Sean's sister, Anna, will live with those horrific memories and have to deal with the consequences of such, determining her ability or not to heal from the trauma she experienced for many years to come, maybe forever. She suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder and reactive attachment disorder. She has nightmares and flashbacks and spends literally hours upon hours crying, screaming, and apologizing to her brother in heaven for hurting him, begging everyone, please tell my Shawnee I'm sorry. Eight months pregnant when she was arrested, my third grandchild, another beautiful granddaughter, was delivered to her jailed mother and immediately placed to her sister. I am grateful and happy to say that both of my granddaughters have been adopted by the wonderful and very loving Christian family who fostered them through the year we fought for justice. And the girls now have every opportunity for healing in a very blessed life. My husband and I have seen them as this amazing family welcomed us into theirs. After about two years, though, and due to the emotional distress Anna suffers, it became very difficult for my granddaughter to see us. There's a constant reminder to her of how very much she missed her parents. We felt there was just too much anguish with all she already has to deal with, and so we bowed out of the girls' lives, at least for now, until they can establish a more secure bond with their new family. We do not want to be cause of any more hurt or pain for these precious children even if it's not specifically or personally because of us. I can't even tell you how much I miss my grandchildren. All of them. As lawmakers of our state, you hold great weight in deciding the policies and laws that govern all of us, including our precious children. I know that all of you take this responsibility very seriously. And I personally appreciate the time, attention, and dedication of everyone in Lansing as you work so very hard to ensure and preserve the quality of life to all Michigan residents. When it comes to our children, I find it heartrending that we must come together the way we are today to hear about the real and true stories of harm and trauma suffered by children and their families. It should be quite unimaginable. Through my family's personal tragic <coughs> experience, we have shockingly and regrettably, regrettably found that the current policies governing the Department of Human Services and the Child Protective Service agencies are grossly inadequate to promote the well-being and safety of the most vulnerable members of our society. Ladies and gentlemen, quite a shocking story. That was Sean's voice. Uh, we have Citizens for Parental Rights meetings held every month, the third Monday of the month from 7 to 9 p.m. at the studios, uh, 5261 Clyde Park Avenue, Wyoming, Michigan. Come on out and join us to reform this. Let's go to Baby Arcade News. Our top story this week. Congress introduces a constitutional amendment for parental rights that would enshrine the liberty of parents to direct the upbringing and education of their children. In Pennsylvania, jury selection begins and ends in the Penn State sex abuse scandal starring former football defensive coordinator Jerry Sandusky, who stands accused of sexually abusing several boys in his care. Due to the Penn State case, the executive director of Pennsylvania Family Support Alliance said that mandated reporters need to be trained so they know what to look for and what to do when they see it. In Georgia, the Penn State case has sparked a new law requiring volunteers to report child abuse. In Penn State, allegations spark a knee-jerk reaction in Louisiana as well after the governor signs a bill to add criminal penalties to those who fail to report sexual abuse. A new study from the University of New Hampshire finds that children living in rural areas are more likely to be substantiated for child abuse than kids living in urban homes. The Colorado Supreme Court hears two cases involving 
involving foster parents regarding whether or not foster parents can continue a parenting relationship with the kids and whether or not they have a right to present arguments in court. In California, efforts to reform Los Angeles County's child welfare system stalls. And the New York Court of Appeals rules that courts cannot grant visitation to parents after their rights have been terminated. According to a new study by the Center for Disease Control, more teenagers are now smoking marijuana than cigarettes. In Connecticut, a school considers allowing drug-sniffing dogs to check students. The state of Minnesota consults with the Mayo Clinic in an effort to get doctors to stop prescribing dangerous psychiatric drugs to kids on Medicaid and in foster care. And in Indiana, foster parents aren't getting their money on time. In Wisconsin, a mother whose two-year-old son was killed by her boyfriend last year is forced to relive the pain after Governor Scott Walker used the kid's picture in a political ad to attack the crime record of his opponent. Facebook is looking at ways to allow kids under 13 onto their site. In Washington, a judge temporarily blocks enforcement of a law that would require advertising companies to verify the ages of people in sex-related advertisements. Texas fathers who are stuck paying child support for kids who aren't theirs have until August to file a paternity suit before the laws stiffen. And the Texas Child Protective Industry is attempting to address a shortage of baby stealers in Bell County by offering generous incentives for newly hired CPS agents. In India this week, homes for special needs kids are now going to be run by the Social Justice Department after a spat of sexual abuse scandals in state-run homes for mentally retarded children. The Russian Foreign Ministry has become aware of another Russian orphan who was adopted out to American parents who has been abused and tortured. In Mexico, babies adopted in an international scam involving Irish couples have been returned to their parents. In Ireland, a 16-year-old boy who threatened to slit his social worker's throat is being held without bail pending DPP directions. In Scotland, a judge calls for the speeding up of child welfare cases. And in New Zealand, government support parties have rallied against a move to give courts the power to stop child abusers and killers from procreating or being placed in charge of children. In Canada, the police are searching for a children's aid society imposter who showed up at a home and removed the clothes of a child to inspect for bruises, but when the mother called to inquire, nobody at the children's aid society knew a thing. Police in Waterloo, Ontario apologized to a father who was arrested and strip searched after his four-year-old daughter drew a picture at school of him holding a gun shooting monsters. On Prince Edward Island, a 71-year-old foster parent is convicted of sexually abusing girls in his care. And in Alberta, the mayor of Edmonton presents an award for outstanding service to Velvet Martin for her tireless advocacy on behalf of the rights of disabled children and their families six years after her daughter Samantha died in a foster home. In Australia, a judge decides that a father can't see his kids in a divorce case even though he did nothing wrong just to satisfy the psychotic ravings of a woman who falsely accused him of child abuse then sends the kids a letter explaining his decision. Australian hospitals are being accused of failing to recognize signs of child abuse and misdiagnosing too many cases as accidents. An Australian mother launches a high court appeal against a family court's decision to send her kids back to live with their allegedly sexually abusive father. And iPad videos are being used to spy on ex-partners in divorce cases. In England, a mother from Gambia is accusing British authorities of abducting her children. British social workers apparently hid the fact that they knew a teenage mother was at risk from sex grooming gangs six years before she was brutally murdered. British grandparents are now being threatened by police for sending birthday cards or presents to their grandkids after the parents have split up. And British social workers are still holding a kid who was born to British parents in France even though there is a high court order to give the baby back and the kid has never even lived in the UK. In entertainment news this week, Mel Gibson's 93 year old father files for divorce from his wife of 10 years alleging prescription of use. In Kiss Bases, Gene Simmons and his old lady ponder adopting a child while throwing their son out of the nest for lazing around and doing nothing. In Ohio, a man gets 25 years in jail for raping an infant during a supervised visit at a county social service building. In Arizona, the boyfriend of a CPS care provider gets two years for child abuse. In Illinois, CPS agents substantiate abuse and neglect allegations against a couple of foster parents. In the Mississippi, a man gets 15 to 30 years in jail for sexually abusing his former foster brother's daughter. In South Dakota, the Lakota People's Law Project releases a special report on a case where a non-Indian foster parent who took in Native American girls was convicted of child rape. In North Carolina, a foster parent who stands accused of sexual abuse denies a plea deal. And in Tennessee, the attorney for the Knox County Commissioner who was caught blowing another guy in a park last week is saying that the Department of Children and Families made false statements about the foster kids who are living in his home. 
home. In Ohio, a mother sits in jail for refusing to hand over two kids to a CPS agent, and police are on the hunt for the two kids who are now safely hidden away. In California, a 12-year-old girl goes missing from her Sacramento foster home. The San Francisco man who was charged with whooping his 11-year-old son's ass with a belt is acquitted of child abuse. A Texas mother is arrested after slapping a 12-year-old daughter in the face for smart-mouthing and cursing her. And finally, tonight, in Pennsylvania, a woman gets sent to jail for stalking the family who adopted her son who was stolen by CPS agents back in 2003 after she allegedly sent flowers and a card to the boy last year. For these stories and all the latest dirt on the child protective industry, visit www.legallykidnapped.com. And until next week, this is Baby LK, over and out. I want to thank you for watching this week. Remember, we have an email address for comments, suggestions, and that is at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com. We also have a social network, which you can visit, and that's at miparentalrights.ning.com. That's miparentalrights.ning.com. Until next week, remember, your voice can make the difference. Check, check, check. One, two. Yeah. We so searching, looking deep inside of every person. Working extra hard, keep it certain. Energy to remedy the hurting. The poetry is what I'm dispersing. Reversing all the negativity, animosity, never stopping me. So searching, for beyond the people and the whole galaxy. Hello, I'm a child protective worker.